So if you open your Bibles, um, our first reading, our Gospel reading is from Luke chapter 4. It's only a short reading. And it's Luke chapter 4, verses 5 to 8. And then we'll go on to read just a little bit from Deuteronomy 10. And we'll be looking at verse 20 there. So Luke 4, verses 5 to 8. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil, taking him up into a high place, up to a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all thou all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then we go to Deuteronomy 10, and if we do 19, 20, 21, it goes like this. Look ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave, and swear by his name. He is thy praise, and he is thy God, that hath done for, these, for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. And may the Lord have his blessing to this reading of his most precious word. Amen. So, there actually is another reading when he quotes Deuteronomy. There is a one which is uh, Deuteronomy 6.13, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shalt swear by him. And it seems, <clears throat> although uh, those are two separate verses, and they have two separate meanings, um, they're actually the same thing. With this second temptation then, remember Christ has come out of the wilderness, He's been baptised by the Holy Spirit. He sees, we've seen the door of his head. God proclaimed that he is his son in whom he is well pleased. And the devil is called to challenge him. Now, we have a picture of the devil, which is a guy with red things sticking out of his head, a pitchfork and a red tail and flames. Actually, no, is... Uh, the Bible, the devil is a very human person. He's the, the fallen angel where he takes on human form. It's not until we get to Revelation that you see him in his true form as a dragon. Because he's a deceiver. That's a great name, that's another title of the devil. He is a deceiver. And that deceiver means he changes his format to suit who he's talking to. He has limited power. But we don't call him the prince of the world for no reason, as we will see. He offered in the first temptation, and I'm recapping because we had the rave last week, for Christ to prove his divinity, his, the part of him that is God incarnate, by taking a stone which God had created, which God had said was perfect and changing it to something for his own needs. And of course, if Christ had done that, he would have created to change something that he said was perfect for his own needs. Therefore, it couldn't have been that perfect. Proving God to have been a liar. Now he appeals to Christ's human needs. So he's a slightly different type. And what he's doing here it's the most base nature of humanity. Humans tend to want two or three things. Two primarily, the third one tends to come with the other two. Power, wealth. The third one's possession, but that tends to come with power and wealth anyway. The devil shows, in summary, Christ, all the country, all the kingdoms of the world, and he makes an offer. He makes an offer to his human, to the human nature of Jesus. That if Jesus would just bow down and worship the devil, the devil will give him everything that he can. Don't we 
look at this from the outside, or from what we know, because we you know we, we, we know from our Bible reading more about the devil. It's hard to think that the devil has the power to offer the kingdoms of the world. But then again, you've also got to remember he called the devil the prince of the world. When Paul writes it, we fight, we don't fight against princes, we fight against the powers. One of the powers we fight against is the devil. And of course, if the devil has the power over the world, then he can offer the kingdoms of the world to whoever he wants. So the challenge here, and I think we need to be very careful with this challenge. You see, having great power normally says you have to have great responsibility. But it doesn't necessarily mean that those who are all powerful, all of those in authority, are dealing with the devil. Although sometimes it may seem like it, it's not always true. Sometimes people have great power, and actually they're not bad people. They do their best in their time and in their place. Their best may not seem much to us, but they do their best. But when you have uncontrolled power, absolute power, then you tend to become corrupted by it. You may start off well-meaning, and I think this is what the devil is getting at. Jesus may well have started off well-meaning as a human part of him, going, I've got the power, I can do anything, I can cure everybody in the world, I can get great power by giving everybody rich, nobody hungry, nobody poor, I can teach a proper religion. I'm going back to Rome here, aren't I? I can do, you know, that's how Rome started, if you think about it. The early popes had great power. I mean, we're always corrupt. It's not until Constantine comes along, around about 300, that the Church of Rome starts to become caught up in the world. Almost as though the bishops of Rome have bowed down to the devil and taken him up on his offer that they made to Jesus. Worship me, says the devil, and I will give you control of all the kingdoms of the earth. And the popes claim to be Lord, spiritual and temporal. They claim to have the power over the kingdoms of the earth. So, you know, one has to wonder where is that, you know, there's a picture here that we can apply to. What happens though, is that when you have people in great power, they start off well. They start off by having great advantages. They may take that advice and they will temper their actions by the advice given to them. Sometimes they will change their mind because they find the advice given to them is good and it's proper and it makes them change their mind. But as they get on and they become more and more of themselves, shall we say, they start going, no, I'm in charge. I'll make the decisions, thank you. I'll tell you what's right and what's wrong. You just have to follow the, you know, the Roman emperors from Julius Caesar right through to um, Maximilian, Maximilius. It's a downward slope of internecine warfare. It, all sorts of terrible things go on in the family. And tell the Roman emperors are nothing but evil, in a way. And the good that they could do is forgotten. And we see this in Europe as well. When you look at the great empires, the British Empire was probably involved in the same way. It started off well, it went downhill. And you've got to wonder. How often they thought it bowed down to Satan. But in our reading, the devil is offering Christ the power over the kingdoms of the world. Power to do with what he wants to do, absolutely. And the human nature of Christ could easily have accepted this offer. 
for a Jewish people, it probably would have meant removing the Roman Empire from Judah and Jerusalem. Because that's really what they were expecting of the Christ, weren't they? They were expecting this military leader to come in with the armies of heaven behind him to remove the Roman invaders and to set up a Jewish state. How do you handle power? And you might go, well, I've got no power. Well, actually, you have. You talk to somebody, and you give advice, and you give guidance, and you go, I think you should do, and they do. That gives you power over them, and you have power over them. If you've got children, you've got power over them. If you're married, you have a form of power maybe share it between you and your wife, and they go back with the falls. It's still power. Every time you do something to somebody or tell somebody to go and do something, you've got power. It may be at work, it may be any aspects of my life. I technically have great power. Because I stand up here and speak. I can tell you, if I didn't demand that you guys kept your Bibles open in front of you and your eyes on the Word of God to match what I, what, what I say, I could tell you anything. I know Church of England priests, I know ministers of religion that do that. They will give you a great, wonderful 20-minute talk. And they could lead you right into the Kingdom of Heaven. And you wouldn't even know. I have power. You all have power. And if we submit to our human feelings, we have the power to destroy people. You only have to say the wrong word and you can destroy people. Or the wrong couple word. You can be little people. I keep telling you about thou shalt do no murder. When we call somebody a name, we murder them. Now, I'm going to share a story here. I was told not too recently about a man that said, well, I call the Pope all sorts of man murdering him. No. You see, the murder happens. Murder tends to mean you do it in the dark. You don't do it openly. So I go and whisper it for dear about Barry. That doesn't murder him. But if I stand up here and say, Barry, blah, 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 Actually, I do it just quickly. And it gives him time to defend himself. Slander is another good word. Slander is that bit where you say something about somebody without being in their ear, and then you say it to lots of people. So just be careful. The challenge to you guys is this. When you have power over people, first of all, acknowledge that you have power. Secondly, acknowledge that you have the ability to destroy people, to upset them, to hurt them. And lastly, you have a responsibility to seek God's guidance in using that power on people. You have a responsibility to nurture and to bring up properly those whom you have power over, to care for them, to love them, to honour them to support them in what they do, to stop them falling into the devil's hands, to keep them on the right track. And if you don't do that, then actually what you've done is you've accepted the gift of the devil of having great power with none of the responsibility. Or with the responsibility that the devil wants you to have to become a dictator. Being a Christian is about having great power and supporting others. It's about having great power and loving others. Seeing them as equal to each of us because they are children of God. Now they may not be saved, they may be heathens, they may be all sorts out of what we understand as the love of God, but you turn your back on them and you're doing the work of the devil. You see, when John wrote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he literally means that. 
He loves all of his creation. Now, not all of his creation is going to respond to God. Only those who are sent by God, as John further tells us, I think it's John 14, only those who are sent by God to Jesus will see Jesus as Savior. Don't you dare decide who that is. There are those who are outside the will of God. What do I mean by that? Yes, God created them. He made them wonderfully well in the, in the image, in their mother's womb. But are they of the elect? Are they saved? We don't know. By their word, deeds, and action, they may have been tempted by the devil and given in to him. And unless God decides otherwise, that's it. They won't be in the kingdom. They won't be sent by God to Jesus to sort of know who Jesus is, to be forgiven their sins. They may not even be under the law because they may not, they may go, there is no God. And that's God's will. Way beyond our understanding. How God can make something in his own image and actually say it's good and then go, actually, it's given in. You can argue it's free will. There's a form of free will which lets him do that. I don't know. But it's there. What then is our response? Christ, at this time, takes his response from Deuteronomy. And I've taken the 10, 20, uh, Deuteronomy 10, uh, 20 verse, um, which goes, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou be, uh, cleave and swear by his name. He um, rephrases that slightly. <coughs> Uh, you shall love the Lord your God. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so he rephrases that uh, uh, slightly. He just doesn't use it as in, in, in as many words. But he responds to the devil by using the word of God and says to him, and says to the devil, you must only love, worship, and serve God. The Creator God. Now this knocks a number of things on the head. It knocks the idea of multiple gods that some religions have, or multiple facets of God. Because Jesus says, you will love, serve, and worship God, singular. And if you are to worship God, singular, then you can't worship the devil. <coughs> you can't worship what you have on earth. You can't esteem it above the worship of God. You go back to the commandments. You know, people look at the Ten Commandments and they go, well, no, you know, Jesus replaced them. No, the Ten Commandments are still in place. Those are the royal law. They're still active, they still have meaning. Christ obeys them. Christ fulfills the ceremonial law for us. We don't have to worry about sacrificing animals for our sins because that once great sacrifice, once and for all, has been done on our behalf. Christ fulfills the law and the prophets on our behalf. We can't do it. He fulfills the word of God and he fulfills the law. He keeps it perfect because we can't. And because we can't, Christ died at the cross. His blood was shed for us so that no more do we need to kill animals on a regular basis in a revolving wheel of sin. And the price of that 
to the who worship God. And we love God. And we serve God. No one else. And it's interesting, if you look at Luke 4, 8, Jesus was also recorded as using the phrase, Get thee behind me, Satan. And I want to send a, I spend a few so short minutes on that phrase. Because it comes elsewhere, doesn't it? It's not the only time in the Bible get thee behind me, Satan is used. You look at Matthew 16, 23, when Christ was prophesying about his death, that he would be taken. And then the, uh, he would be taken, and he would be taken by the, the leaders of the Sanhedrin, and he'd have to go to Jerusalem. And people said, Peter said to him, that mustn't happen. That mustn't happen. You mustn't go. What does Jesus do? Jesus says to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Now the phrase is not actually saying that Peter is the devil, because the devil is a specific individual. But Satan's work for the devil. They are inspired to do the devil's bidding. And Satan's inhabit life. And notice if Peter can be a Satan, then you can be a Satan. Anybody can be a Satan, because a Satan has a very particular role. And you may think, well, I believe in Jesus and I can't work for the evil. Actually, you can believe in Jesus and still be a Satan. Peter walked with Jesus. Not only did he believe, but he knew him and talked to him. And he's Peter that declares that you are the son, the Messiah of, the, uh, the Messiah of God. So Peter knew exactly who he was. And he was still the Satan. You see... Satan is somebody who gets in the way. Actually, it's slightly worse than that. The Satan is somebody who places something between you and God. <coughs> somebody who wants to divert you. And they'll do it wonderfully well. The Church of Rome will do it with Murphy. You see them all. I don't know about you, but on my uh, Facebook account, I'm starting to get loads of tweets about uh, uh, the feast. Is it the feast of the Assumption? It's one of them. They're carrying all over Europe. They're carrying these statues of Mary on, on thingies and parading through towns in Europe, and in England, and in Scotland. I mean, you know, Popery has come back with a vengeance. That's the Roman Catholic Church placing something, i.e., a statue of a dead woman, be it Mary. You know, a statue of a dead woman, and she is dead, and she was a woman. Can't argue about that. You know, and they go, oh, pray to Mary as an intercessor between you and God, and she will talk to her son for you. Well, that's what Satan does. Because you're supposed to worship God. When we pray, we don't pray to Jesus. We follow Jesus' example. Jesus didn't pray to himself, he prayed to God. When we pray, we pray to God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to dead statues. Not to statues of stone. Not to pieces of metal. Not to somebody holding... I, I was amazed at this one, but I thought it was something you only saw in medieval movies. You know, in movies about medieval times, sorry. Where you've got a man holding a big... I think it's called a monstrous. Monstrous. Is that right? Monstrous? And they have a bit of bread in it, which is a communion bread, and he can't touch it with his hands. He's got this cloak on, and his hands are in the cloak, and his cloak is holy. He's not allowed to touch it. It's so holy. And you tell me that is not putting something in the way between you and God. And this is what the devil does. When he is Offering Christ all the kingdoms of the world, it may be useless. The devil knows exactly who Jesus is. The devil knows the Bible better than you and me and any other theologian because it concerns him. It concerns his faith. You know? But if the devil can tempt the human nature of Christ, 
just as he tempted Eve in the garden. And then think of the damage he could do. I mean, we look to the coming of Christ again. And he will come again. And Satan is there to stop that happening. But he can't stop it happening because it's going to happen. But if he can delay it, and if he had managed to knock Jesus, the human part of Jesus, of course, and some other plan would have actually had to come into place, I would argue. You know? And we would be waiting a lot longer than we are. What the devil tends to forget at this point, and I do one believe from Scripture that Christ was very aware of his mission on earth from the time he was baptized. And this is why he was able to defeat the devil. And in this human form, he is the embodiment of a servant king. Christ did not come here to be lauded, to be worshipped, to be a leader. He came to bring the lost sheep back to God. I think that's a good way of putting it. He came to find the lost. He came to find the widow, the orphan, the sick. All of those people that the religious, the Sanhedrin, the religious, the, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, all the religious elite have pushed out away from God. He came to find you and me. And he came to be a servant king. And you want to know more about the nature of Christ. Look at the prophet Isaiah. You know, there's a couple of verses, verses 42, uh, verses, if you look at the chapters 42, 49, 50, 52, they're in there. Just look it up on Google, look for the servant king in Isaiah. And they're all there. But read your Bible, don't read what's on the web, just look it up for the references. It's a great reference. It's almost as good as Cruden's in actually finding uh, the chapters of the verses that you want. Christ did not come to lord it over us. If he was going to do that, he wouldn't have been born in a manger. He would have been born in a palace somewhere. In fact, he would, probably wouldn't have even been born. He would have just descended with the armies of heaven at that point. But that was not his purpose. And that's not our purpose. Christ's purpose was to find the lost. The lost sheep of Israel. And that's you. And that's me. That's all of them out there. He was to be our servant. And that makes you servants of the servant king. And not servants in a slavish way. We are willing servants. We should so love the Lord Jesus Christ that we want to do his will and his bidding. And what's the will and bidding of, 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 of Jesus? To tell people about the Father. To pray for them. To fulfill the rules of going up, looking after the widow, feeding the homeless, caring for the orphan, looking after the sick. All of those. Caring for those who don't have be cared for by those that have. And you may say, well, I don't have anything. Actually, you know what? You're the richest people around. George, Paul, Barry, Danny. All the others. You're, you're rich beyond compare. You don't know how rich you are. Oh, fine, yes, you don't have big houses. Except for Barry, who's got his castle with his name. Uh, <laughs> you don't have big houses. You don't have fine clothes, maybe. You don't have holiday flat tickets two weeks a year and all the rest of it. But I believe you are rich. You are rich because you have the Lord Jesus Christ. And that leads everything. <coughs> better than gold, better than jewels, and you make better than pearls. And you may say to yourself, well, I can't spend it. I can't benefit by it. Actually, you have been there. You've benefited so much by being your friend. For the fear of hell is taken away. You've got nothing to fear in that. 
this is just temporary. You fall asleep, you wake up, kind of build over the life, crossing the ocean. There's many in this world I know that would give their arms and feet for that. You see that as they all trot off to their churches, where they get told anything but they need the gospel to repent, to be baptized, to believe on the Lord and on and in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are rich beyond compare. And there are thousands like you out there. And some of them have to give the ultimate sacrifice for their faith. Some of us will be punished, some of us will be locked up for the prison. That doesn't take away your riches. Standing for Christ and in Christ alone is the greatest thing that we can do. And the millionaires, we are better than that. We are oh so much better than millionaires. May not be rich in how the world sees us. But how the world sees riches is how the devil sees riches, is how the devil tries to tempt Christ. We are so much better. Bishop Brown once made a statement. He showed that he was uh, documenting five, five statements by evangelical Christianity. He goes, one of them goes, if you put anything between man and God, man will by default try to worship the bit in between. So you need to make sure, be on the defense at all times, that nobody puts something between you and God. This isn't the last time that Christ will be tempted. There's one more to go. But in this, Christ has to be fa failed. Well, sorry, the devil has failed to tempt Christ's divine nature and his human nature. I don't think there was actually any danger of it. But if he could just deflect Christ from his course, then where would we be? So what lessons do we take? I think the first is to look at how absurd, how absurd the promise of earthly power is that the devil makes. He's asking the Christ to forget God and serve him as master. The bait is a better life. But as I said before, Jesus didn't come for a better life. <clears throat> Jesus that knew what was coming. You can argue about whether he knew it from a baby or whether he knew it from when he was baptised, but he knew what was coming. The scriptures make it pretty clear, pretty plain, he knew. At least from the mount where uh, he talks to the disciples of Caesarea Philippi, he knew exactly what was going to happen in the future. And he knew because he knew the prophets, because the prophets foretold him. So he knows that the offer of the devil is pointless. It's a lie, and there's no point in accepting it. You see, the other reason there's no point in Jesus accepting the offer of the devil is this, and this is the same for you. Whenever you think the devil is tempting you, just consider this. When it was up to Jesus, God had already prepared for Christ the same titles. Christ would be king over all the kingdoms of the earth. The devil was only promising him what God had already said and decreed would be Christ's. And this is the warning for you lot, and for me. There's a prosperity preacher out there, preachers out there, think of the prosperity gospel. And it's full of sin. It is full of sin. Christians are not promised a good life on this planet. In fact, actually, this being in this world is our enemy. But God has promised us a reward and happiness far beyond what this world can offer. And that's why I say to you, you are far richer, far more wealthier than this world can even imagine. I think the second application we can take from this is when you want to refute something with the use the word of God, use it to say to yourself, should I be doing this? 
Is this what I'm meant to be doing? And I tell you this, and I believe that it's not important that you understand or you can bring to mind, you know, Deuteronomy 10, verse 20. I don't think that really matters. I don't say that lightly. But you've got to remember that chapters and verses are a new invention in the Bible. They weren't there to start with, they were just big books. What matters is that you know the verse. You know where it is. Even Christ himself doesn't exactly quote Deuteronomy, but he quotes what Deuteronomy means. To love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart, and with all your might. And if that's good enough for Christ, then it's good enough for you. I give you fair warning, though. If you use the word of God for your own purpose, if you add to it, or you subtract from it, if you use it wrongly, you will have a conscience. You must use it correctly, you must become familiar with it. How do you become familiar with the Word of God? You read it on a regular basis. Until it seeps into you. Until you go, oh I know that's in the Bible. I can tell you that's in Luke, or that's in Matthew, or that's in Ephesians, or that's in Deuteronomy, or in Leviticus, or in Psalms. And if you're really good, yes, you might be able to remember the exact chapters and verses. I think it matters that you know more where they are and how to plant them. I think that's the sign of a good Christian. It shows that you've studied your book, that you know where these things are. And therefore you can point to this truth. Thirdly, and lastly, I think for all of us, we need to do the same as Christ, as Christ did. Not just to stand up to the devil, but also to stand up to the peoples of this world. What do I mean by that? Well, when we are challenged or persuaded to do stuff that goes against our service to God, not to set before, our response has to be, get thee behind me, Satan. Christ identifies the devil as a Satan, <coughs> just a title. And Peter as Satan, as Satan is just a title. It's a behavior. It doesn't matter who it is. They can be the most saintly, holy person you know. If they do something and tell you to do or induce you to do something that takes you away from God, they are a Satan. Literally, two words in the Hebrew Satan. One who stands between. Be aware. Be very aware. I think you do this, all of this, in small steps. Don't try and run before you can walk. Be encouraged to grow in faith. Read the Bible, read the other books. Have a look around. Even read ones that challenge Christianity so you can see what the enemy is thinking. Set aside time. Set aside a place. And if you need, and somebody tries to stop you doing that, just tell them to get behind you, Satan. When you commit to doing something for God, you must be singularly focused to complete the task. Everything else is great. God first. Why? Well, let's look at the commandments. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. You make him wait, he's not going to be happy. He would not look and, and, and he doesn't look and goes, oh, well, you know, Ian had to do that first for whatever reason. He goes, then, and first, everything else second. He doesn't look kindly on those that promise to do something for him or in his name and then go and do something else so they don't do it at all. There's no halfway house. You are either for God in Christ or you're not. No mystery. No easy way. God or Satan. If it's God first, then fine. 
you will have Satan and your coat there of battle and you can run. If it's the devil first, well, you've got the Bible. God's already given you the ammunition you need, you just need to find it. But you also need to go, am I meant to be doing something else with God's will? That's a tough choice in this devil driven world. Just one that all believers have to make. And it's not one you make one time. This will this war will go on every day, every hour, every minute of your lives. We say in the baptismal, uh, when he's doing children's up here, we mean sin, the world, and the devil. It starts as soon as the devil knows you are coming to church, and it ends the day you're in your little wooden box. And the battle is over. I urge you to practice not worshipping anything that gets between you and God. There's no putting God off until the middle of the day. No delaying. You either do what you say you're going to do, or if you don't say you're going to do it. You either keep your promise to God, and God will keep his promise to you, or you don't keep your promise to God, and God, the Bible tells us, will respond like one. The choice is yours. God 